welcome to the St. Genevieve Catholic Church and a special welcome out there to all our visitors and our listeners today. Today we celebrate the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. My name is Father Don Henke. I am a professor at Kenrick Glennon Seminary. And at one point, way back when, Father Nemuth was one of my students. Uh, it's a delight to be here with you this morning to celebrate this Mass. As we begin then, let us take a moment to acknowledge our sins and prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. Lord Jesus, God of peace, Lord have mercy. Christ Jesus, you are the cornerstone of the kingdom. Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, you provide everything for your people. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth to the people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, in the name of O God, O God, O God, Lord Jesus Christ, we God, the Son. Lord God, the plan of God, Son of the Father. You take away the sins of the world, and blesses us. You take away the sins of the world, this is our prayer. You are the seed of the right hand of the Father, and blesses us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Holy Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, First reading, reading from the book of Isaiah. Let me now say of my friend, my friend's song concerning his vineyard. 
My friend had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He spayed it, cleared it of stones, and planted the choicest vines. Within it, he built a watchtower, and he hewed out a wine press. Then he looked for the crop of grapes, but what it yielded was wild grapes. Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judea judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done? Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now I will let you know what I mean to do to my vineyard. Take away its hedge and give it to grazing. Break through its wall and let it be trampled. Yes, I will make it a ruin. It shall not be pruned or hoed, but overgrown with thorns and briars. I will command the clouds not to send rain upon it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his cherished plant. He lived for judgment, but see, bloodshed. For justice, but hark, the outcry, the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. A vine from Egypt you transplanted, drove away the nations and planted it. It put forth its foliage to the sea, its shoots as far as the river. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. What have you broken? Why have you broken down its walls so that every passerby plucks its fruit? The boar from the forest lays it waste, and the beasts of the field feed upon it. Once again, O Lord of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Take care of this vine. Protect what your right hand is planted, the son of man whom you yourself made strong. Then we will no more withdraw from you. Give us new life, and we will call upon your name. O Lord, God of hosts, restore us. If your face shine upon us, then we shall be saved. The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. The second reading is a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, Hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew, drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. But the tenants seized the servants, and one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. 
Again, he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent a son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answered him, He will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce at the proper times. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and, and given to a people that will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. subject a vineyard and because parables were never intended to be all that difficult to understand this one as well is pretty straightforward so the landowner of the vineyard of course represents God the vineyard itself symbolized the nation of Israel and because we are the spiritual heirs of those people. It also applies to us Christians. The tenants were the leaders of the people. The servants of the landowner were the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, David, and the prophets, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and all those other ones. The hedge that was put around the vineyard was meant to be kind of an idea of the distinguishing mark of God's people, something that made them distinctive, their belief in one God, their liturgy, and commands like love your neighbor as yourself, all those were to show that they were a people set apart. The tower represented God's protection, and the wine press was meant to give the idea of the purpose of the people, which was to produce good fruit, to kind of be wine for the gladness and flourishing of the rest of the world. And then there's also this other little detail that once the landowner had gotten everything set the way it was supposed to be, he went away on a journey. So it wasn't his intention to be a micromanager and to kind of hover over everybody and intimidate them by his presence. No, he gave them a certain amount of autonomy and independence and the respect that is due to creatures who have free will. The problem that both parables identify though is that at some point with this freedom they allowed themselves to forget just who and whose they were. And so that's something that Pope Benedict pointed out in one of his books when he wrote, isn't what is said in this parable precisely the logic of the modern age? Let us declare God dead, or at least irrelevant, then we ourselves will be like God. At last we can do what we please. The vineyard belongs to us. So, 
Hold that thought for a second. So there's a question that comes up in these readings that we're meant to reflect on, and it's just who do we think we are? Not in the smart aleck sense, but in its deepest sense, who do we believe we are as we stand before God? In my class at each semester, there's a, there's a thing that all of my students reflect on, and it's this particular question. Just why did God forbid Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You can think about this too. And I generally get variations of two responses to that question, and both of them are usually wrong. So the first one is, is that God issued that command to Adam and Eve as a way of establishing the divine will. That God gave Adam and Eve the garden and everything in it, but he said, you can't eat from the tree the knowledge of good and evil because he was trying to show them just who was in charge. No apples for you. So thanks, God, that's great. The second idea was that God gave Adam and Eve the garden, but he also placed them at a test, a little test, that you have all the animals, almost all the, all the plants except this particular tree, and it was to determine whether or not they would remain faithful to him. And as I said, both of those ideas are wrong to a certain degree. And the reason is, is that if God revealed himself to us as love through and through, which he did, then there's nothing in him that seeks to have dominance over people and order them around. And by the same token, he wouldn't be out setting traps to catch them in some kind of infidelity. But that's not how God operates. That the reason, the real reason why God told Adam and Eve they were forbidden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is something you have to wrap your mind around a little bit. Is that as the creator, he's not just the maker of the world. He's the maker of everything, of all reality, of all things visible and invisible that we'll all profess in the creed in just a little bit. And what that means is that everything is founded on him. What's good is good precisely because it flows from God, who is good. Which means that good and evil were never up for debate. It's not as if that God just pulled the Ten Commandments out of his head one day, and said, this will be good and that will be evil, but that reasonable people could disagree and come up with a different list. No, life is good and death is evil because God is life. Everything that helps life to grow and to flourish generally tends to be good, and things that will demean, damage, or diminish life tend to be bad. The same would be true for love, which God is, and truth, and kindness, and generosity, and purity, all those things describe the nature of God. Those things are the atmosphere of heaven. They're opposites. Death, and hatred, and anger, and lust, and greed. All those things are evil because they're exactly, precisely what God is not. Those things describe the atmosphere of hell. It means that good and evil were never up to Adam and Eve to decide. But that was already set by the very nature of God. So realize then that when Adam and Eve made the choice they made, their calculation was deliberate. St. Paul says, though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. But Adam and Eve did. They did. And their choice 
changed everything for us. Their decision, our faith teaches us, damaged all humanity from the very beginning, from conception. We have been wounded. And the church says that we've been wounded in four specific ways. There's what it says as ignorance of the intellect, which means that we're not as smart as we think we are. Even us sophisticated 21st century Americans. The original sin, the original wound has damaged us in such a way that we don't see things straight on anymore. That our understanding is flawed. The second thing is what's called malice of the will or rebellion in the heart. And that means generally that we want things the way we want them. My plan, my design, what seems reasonable to me. Nobody standing over me telling me what I can and cannot do. The third is what's called concupiscence of the appetites. And it means that our drives and desires, the things that we want a lot of times, not a healthy or reasonable amount of things, but excesses of them. Excesses of things like food and drink and sex and other pleasures. That they've been kind of warped out of their proper holy order. Why do you think so many people so easily fall into drug or alcohol addiction? Or why do we all have to struggle so hard to maintain a healthy weight? Or why do so many people get enslaved by pornography? Well, part of the reason is concupiscence. And then finally, the fourth effect is that we suffer and die. The fourth effect of our woundedness is that we've cut ourselves off from God who is life. And that this is the consequence. The parable of the vineyard is meant to help us reflect on the times we have forgotten just who and whose we are. That everything we have, every good thing is given to us by God. And that yes, he expects things from us and he gives us commands and gives us guidance. Not to be bossy. Not to order us around, but that he is the way. And he shows us what it means to get to a healthy and happy and holy life. And if we're honest, we know that it's not forced on us. There's no Vatican SWAT team sent out to make sure that we obey. The pastor doesn't show up at your door to make sure you're living right. But that God is trying to show us things that we might not recognize because of our woundedness. In a very real sense, what Jesus is, what his life and actions are, what the gospel is and what it teaches, what the dogma of the church is, it's like glasses. It's like contacts, if you prefer. Spiritual lenses to help the spiritually impaired. And that we're meant to take that seriously and reflect on how we follow what design God has marked out for us for our good and flourishing or where we rebel because we think we know more or we want it the way we want it. God is out to give us everything for our flourishing and happiness. He's out to make us saints, and he's trying to show us how to get there. Have a blessed Sunday.
was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became the king. For our sake, he was crucified and He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who are the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the Lord and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. I confess with the baptism of the forgiveness of sins, and I am the Lord to the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the Lord. Confident in God's unfailing love for his people, we offer him our needs and prayers this morning. For a deeper love for Our Lady during this month devoted to the Holy Rosary, may we allow this devotion to flourish in our life and in our families. We pray to the Lord. For unity among all members of our nation, that the things that divide and separate us will never overcome the bound of unity found in freedom. We pray to the Lord. For the health and wellness of our community, may we continue to be preserved from the effects of this pandemic and for a restoration of all those whose lives and livelihood have been affected. We pray to the Lord. For all those who are sick, suffering, homebound, or in nursing homes, May they experience the healing presence of Christ in their lives. We pray to the Lord. And for all those personal prayers and attentions we hold in our hearts. We pray to the Lord. God the Father, hear our prayer. Hear us, God the Son, Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Mercy on your people, Lord. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrifices instituted by your commands, and through the sacred mysteries which we celebrate with dutiful service, graciously complete the sanctifying work by which you are pleased to redeem us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and work of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death and glory. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim, by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, 
especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Genevieve, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Mitchell, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you as their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, communion, we will pray. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I am not able at this moment to receive you sacramentally, I ask that you spiritually enter into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself fully to you. Never permit me to be separated from you.
Let us pray. Grant us, Almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In your kindness, please pray for the repose of the soul of Paul Jokerst. Visitation will be Sunday from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Basel Funeral Home. Funeral Mass will be Monday at 10 a.m. Congratulations to Kurt Barr and Megan Hook, who were married this weekend. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Mass is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. The protection against the wickedness and the devil. May God be with you and we humbly pray. And we now have the By the power of God, the of Satan, and all evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of the world.